In early spring 2008, two young bison bulls jumped a sagging three-string barbed wire fence, separating Chihuahua, Mexico from New Mexico in the United States. On both sides of the international line lay an unbroken grassland valley, scoured almost bare by a prolonged drought, which announced itself meanly on the dusty hides stretched taut over bison bones. D.H. Lawrence once wrote, he never saw a wild thing sorry for itself. And this ragtag band of bison was no exception. They had been eking out an existence in an unforgiving land for almost a century, weathering the seasons of famine and plenty, pursuing one all-consuming preoccupation that prompted their every move, survival. Bison are creatures of simple needs, requiring only some grass, reliable water, and space to roam, a hardiness that enabled them to migrate by the millions as lords of the vast prairies of North America for millennia before European settlers arrived. But needs are needs, and survival is serious business in a landscape now scored by roads, fences, and other obstacles foreign to the natural contours of the prairie. The haggard bison barely paused in their crossing that day, it was a simple leap over a fence their herd had broken down a hundred times, a known inconvenience encountered during frequent travels between the pond where they had drunk that morning and a reliable patch of pasture for grazing. The bull's herd had found this location dozens of years earlier and since then had relied on it for the two main staples of its survival. The fact that there was an international boundary between pond and pasture meant nothing to them. They made the jump and headed off toward dinner. Meanwhile, a few thousand miles away, a room full of politicians sat tossing a political rotten tomato called immigration, everyone taking care not to soil their hands, while engineers sketched out rough plans and construction companies procured concrete and steel. And the United States began to raise its great wall a wall that if it comes to fruition along the entire 2,000 mile border will divide not only two nations and their people, but an entire continent of creatures like the bison already taxed to the breaking point by the business of survival. So what we call immigration or emigration is a phenomenon natural to all animals and plants. All migration is a move from scarcity toward plenty and scarcity can be a natural reality brought on by climates and floods, droughts, but it can also be manufactured by policy and politics. In the early 1990s, the North American Free Trade Agreement um, was ratified, and it had many impacts, some of which are still being felt today, but one of the most immediate impacts um, was to spur migration. It destabilized Mexico's farm economy by flooding Mexican markets with cheap industrial farm goods. It put millions of farmers in Mexico out of work and off their land. And it led to extreme poverty and malnutrition in rural communities, which of course sent millions of migrants northward where there was a demand for labor. And around about the same time, the Clinton administration launched what it called Operation Gatekeeper. And basically what Operation Gatekeeper did was to crack down on the traditional routes of migration through urban centers like El Paso and San Diego, um, which then funneled migrants through remote, rugged, and dangerous lands, which also created intense disturbance of ecosystems and wildlife habitats. So why should we care about the impacts of policy on the borderlands? Because the borderlands are remote, but they're not empty. Um, I have this map and it shows San Diego on the west coast and El Paso sort of in the center. Um, and those were the traditional routes of migration before Operation Gatekeeper. Um, but after that, um, migrants spread out because they had to find new places to cross because they really didn't have any choices. So what they did was they went into this incredible landscape that is the borderlands. And you can see highlighted on this map um, there are different ecosystem types that all span the borderlands. Um, there's the Sonoran Desert, there's the Sky Islands region, 
um, the Chihuahuan Desert and the Rio Grande Valley. And um, I just want to tell you a little bit about my experience in some of those places. At scorching noon, the summer desert smells of choking dust. The July sun boils on bare skin, making it scream for shade. And everything from cactus to reptile to human creature shrinks under its searing stare. Nothing moves under the burdensome heat haze simmering above the desert floor. So silent is the land, so vast and still and blisteringly hot, that standing unprotected upon this landscape, it is literally painful to exist. But July noon is, like any moment in time, fleeting. On that same day, at about 5 p.m., as the sun begins its descent over the Pacific, clouds start to gather in great cottony clumps that shatter the monochromatic desert sky. As they cover the face of the departing sun, a cool shadow spreads over the land, prompting a lizard to venture out from under a protective boulder. He cocks his head from side to side, while a white-winged dove begins to coo softly. A jackrabbit pads out from under the shade of a mesquite tree, nosing around for seeds, while the gathering clouds begin to darken and agitate. People hiding in their cool houses and offices glance out windows and open doors and sigh as the very ground beneath them seems to sigh in relief. A great crack rips through the now humid air and the sky releases a long-awaited treasure upon the land. The rain comes first in a scattered pattering of large drops on the dry ground that sizzle and steam and then in a torrent of a month's moisture that had been hoarded in the oppressive blue of the oceanic summer sky. The deluge lasts for an hour before the clouds break, and as the sun sinks beyond the hem of the horizon, the sky ignites in pastel flame, and a golden-hued desert swells with satisfaction and life, smelling of sweet creosote and noisy with the song of grateful creatures once again at ease in the world. It is a moment a desert dweller can best appreciate, but anyone can understand as the unique brand of beauty that follows the harshest of pain. The cycles of desert life can flow from torturous to sweet in an instant, urged on by the whim of a wind, the whisper of a god, or the rhythm of some perfect cosmic order. Whatever first cause set this symphony of fire it is to be revered as the genesis of astounding communities of perseverant creatures that exist precisely because of the merciless character of this land. This collection of life forms could not coexist anywhere else on the planet except this one place, the Sonoran Desert. Land of rainbows and rattlesnakes, wildflowers and withering death, in all its sublime and wretched perfection. The rainy season and the contours of the land that determine where water will linger meter the pulse of wild creatures who have honed their senses to the smell, taste, and sound of the lifeblood of the desert. Most of the year, the couch's spadefoot toad lies hidden beneath the earth waiting, waiting, waiting for the sound of water. Pat, pat, tap, tap, tap. Percussive summer raindrops summer the spade foot to burrow out of the ground and charge toward the nearest place where water congregates. At the nearby pool, the spade foot sings a song of summer love, bursting into a mating call like the bleeding of a goat that can be heard a mile away. These first moments, after a year of repose or longer, are followed by an explosion of feeding, breeding, and growing as fast as possible before the spadefoot's precious pool evaporates. This pool represents all there ever was, all there is, or ever will be for the spadefoot. It is his universe, his own fragile thread of connection to eternity. Within this pond, 
which may exist for only a few weeks, the Spadefoot's entire life and future lie. His only hope of creating a new generation of little spade feet to bear his genes into the future. So in the Sonoran Desert, all life is tied to water and shelter from the heat. And the same is true of the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, the Chihuahuan Desert lies a little bit to the east of the Sonoran. And um, it appears, when you look at it at first glance, um, like just grass. And I've heard a lot of people say this. It's just a monoculture of grass. There's nothing there. Um, so I just want to tell you a little story about an experience that I had there. Um, I first got started on this project when I was working on this story on the bison. And one of the things I was doing there was to sort of document the other species that live in the grassland with bison. And so I went out one morning. I had a blind that was set up near um, uh, this prairie dog hole. And um, I, it was the first time I'd ever photographed prairie dogs from a blind. And so um, somewhat foolish, I, I put the blind out. I got up at like 4 in the morning. It was freezing out. And I, I didn't realize until about three hours into it without seeing any prairie dogs that they're smart enough not to get up that early and go out in the cold. <laughs> and so I waited and I waited and waited. And finally, I put my head down because I was really tired of waiting. And I heard these voices beneath the ground. And it was the prairie dogs. And they, were, they apparently had a, a burrow that was right beneath my blind. And they were sitting there, like, having this conversation. And um, prairie dogs, they've been studied by scientists, and they're known to have one of the most sophisticated vocabularies of any mammal that's ever been studied. Um, they have a different name for a, a short human with a yellow shirt um, versus a tall human with a green shirt. So they're very vocal. I have no idea what they're saying, but, um, but I could, it just, it was so, it was just a moment where I could, hear like the voices in this world, this underground world that nobody ever sees or even knows is there, but they've, they've got this life that they're living. And um, it was a really powerful moment. Um, and prairie dogs as a species are really important, um, adorable and important. Um, they're a keystone species for grasslands um, because they, they're a really key prey species for a lot of different, um, different pre predators. They, um, they create this underground world of burrows. They're mainly responsible for creating those burrows. And within those burrows live um, kit fox. And um, kit fox actually eat the prairie dogs, which is not very nice return for them creating their homes. But um, also burrowing owls. Um, they live a little more amicably with the prairie dogs than the kit fox. Um, and not in the burrows, but also in the grasslands are porcupines and jaguars. Um, jaguars mostly live in, in uh, the mountain ranges. They live a little bit higher up, but they, you know, um, they are known to be in the grasslands as well, as also in the Sonoran Desert. And there are not very many jaguars in the United States anymore. Most of their um, habitat has been destroyed. They were um, hunted to near extinction. Um, but they're one of five five of the six North American cat species um, that live in the borderlands. And this is the only place in the United States where all of those cat species live. Um, so it's a very special place for wild cats, um, and jaguars are one of them. So a little bit further to the east, this is in um, Big Bend National Park, and this is a place called Santa Elena Canyon. And um, you can see on the, on the right here is the United States, the right wall. On the left is Mexico. And I was taking this picture in the middle of the Rio Grande, so I was sort of straddling these two countries. Um, but this is one of the places where you, you wouldn't even know that, there was, um, that the, you were looking at a different country on one side of the canyon wall versus the other. So quite a bit further to the east in the lower Rio Grande Valley um, is a really special location. Um, this is... This place is, is um, one of the highest bird diversities in the United States. Um, just an incredible collection of animals that live here because it's a borderlands, a natural borderlands. Um, it's the kind of the meeting of the tropical zone and the temperate zone. So all of these animals that don't coexist anywhere else in the world coexist 
in this place. And so you can see a northern cardinal, which we all see around here, um, sitting in the same tree as a green jay, these beautiful tropical jays. And also plain chachalacas, very, um, very funny looking birds. There are more than 500 species. Like I said, it's really an incredible place. And there's also two endangered cat species that live there, ocelots and jaguarundis, um, 300 species of butterflies, and more than 100 species of dragonflies. So it's a really special place. And, and what makes it even more special is that less than 5% of the native habitat exists in this location. Um, unfortunately, most of it has been changed from this, um, which was the, the native habitat, a thorn scrub, to, to this. In the 1980s, the US government started paying people to slash and burn the thorn scrub. Um, and so most of the landscape there now looks like this and is home to, to no, pretty much no animals. So what, what is left is uh, really special and important. So all of this is to say borderlands policy is also environmental policy. Um, this, is, this is a place that many scientists consider to be the most, if not one of the most, if not the most biodiverse regions in North America. So back to policy. Um, Operation Gatekeeper was based on this idea of prevention by deterrence. And the idea was that by making travel so difficult and so dangerous, migrants would give up trying. But unfortunately, this was based on a faulty premise, which was that the migrants had other good options in life. They didn't, and it didn't work. Operation Gatekeeper poured billions of dollars into infrastructure and agents, and the number of undocumented immigrants increased in the 1990s from about 2 million to about 5 million by the year 2000. And at this point, many migrants were now traveling through sensitive protected lands. Um, the number of arrests on federal lands in Arizona rose from 500 in 1997 to 110,000 by the year 2000. The National Park Service estimated that 200,000 migrants came through Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument in 2001 compared to a couple of hundred before Operation Gatekeeper went into effect. So this policy was heralded, of course, um, as a success by the Clinton administration, but it didn't stop people. It just rerouted them through parks, wilderness, and rural towns. And one of the impacts of that was that migrant deaths spiked almost immediately. Since Operation Gatekeeper was launched in the 90s, 6,000 migrants have died trying to cross this border. As urban crossing became more and more difficult over the years, finding identities for the escalating number of bodies became increasingly difficult. Badly disfigured bodies would arrive at a county coroner's office with no identification and be cataloged with a single name, John Doe and a number. John Doe 01-177 came into the Imperial County Coroner's Office as a collection of bones and scraps of clothing, and a single belonging, a bus ticket to Mexicali. With nothing to help identify him, the coroner sent John Doe 01-177 to the Pauper Cemetery in Holtville, California, where the graves of the poor and unknown sit in a muddy field behind the manicured Terrace Park Cemetery. Out in that bare field, Signs warn visitors that cave-ins are common, and many of the grave sites are sunken into the earth. Graves are marked with crumbling bricks, some with small painted crosses bearing a single phrase, no olvidados, not forgotten. Somewhere among those crosses and stones lies John Doe 01-177 in a plain wooden box beside hundreds of other John and Jane Doe's, the faceless dead of the borderlands nightmare. So around the time that the Clinton administration was coming to an end, 
there was a lot of discussion about um, these migrant deaths and what to do about it. And I just want to read you a quote um, that somebody said at the time. Family values do not stop at the Rio Grande River. There are moms and dads who have children in Mexico, and they're hungry, and they're going to come to try to find work. If they pay $5 in one place and $50 in another place, and they've got mouths to feed, they're going to come. It's a powerful instinct. It's called being a mom and being a dad. And that was a quote by George W. Bush. Um, and he, he said this while he was campaigning for the presidency. And he came into office with a vow to change our failed border and immigration policy. Instead, pressed by Congress, he took a failed policy and doubled down with a massive escalation of the Clinton era policy. He used the authority given under the Real ID Act to waive 37 laws, including the Endangered Species Act, Clean Air Act, and Clean Water Acts, the Wilderness Act, and the Migratory Bird Treaty. It was the largest waiver of law in history, and it remains in force today. 650 miles of wall now cover one-third of the border and are estimated to cost $25 billion or more. So one question, is it worth it to build that wall? For my work, more importantly, the costs go well beyond dollars. This is a photo of, uh, of a place where there is no environmental law. Um, this is the Sonoran Desert. And this is what that landscape would have looked like had it been protected. This is a protected landscape. And this is what it has become. And it will never recover. Um, these places like this, they're so sensitive, they're, there is no going back. You can't recover that place. This is a, a list of the laws that have been waived on the border. Um, they're laws to protect species on the verge of extinction laws protecting the air that we breathe. They include the Safe Drinking Water Act, the National Park Service Organic Act, the Eagle Protection Act, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, and the Wilderness Act, which will celebrate its 50th anniversary this year. And this is a photo of a designated roadless wilderness um, that the Border Patrol gouged a road through in order to get to the border. That's not even the border there. Um, but they could do that because the Wilderness Act no longer applies here. In the Pinacate Biosphere Reserve in northern Sonora, Mexico, a bighorn ram heads north. Water sources in the western Sonoran Desert are few, especially in summer, but water persists in rare locations, including the one he's headed to a half mile north in the Tanajas Altis Mountains in southwestern Arizona. On this trip, the bighorn, one of Mexico's most endangered species, brings his lambs and mates. Because summer requires frequent trips to water, and the young ones have not yet learned the route. Luckily for him, the map he carries in his head of the location of water, etched deep in memory from many hundreds of trips over his lifetime, has no markings of international boundaries. The only laws he obeys are the life and death laws of nature. Wild species like the desert bighorn that live in arid lands must make frequent use of scarce resources shared across the landscape. These creatures live on the very edge of existence, either by the nature of the land they inhabit, which is prone to drought and temperature extremes, or due to human disturbance, hunting, or habitat degradation. The Sonoran pronghorn, a subspecies of pronghorn that is adapted to life in the Sonoran Desert, is a creature of two binational distinctions. It is the fastest land mammal in both the United States and Mexico, and it is also one of the most endangered. Habitat loss and fragmentation from highways, livestock, agriculture, and military use of the land displaced pronghorn from much of their habitat and isolated them from others of their kind. Barely clinging to existence in the United States, 
The Sonoran pronghorn's greatest hopes for escaping extinction are increased connectivity to the slightly larger and more genetically diverse population in Mexico and decreased disturbance from humans in its habitat in the states. Life for the pronghorn and bighorn and many others hinges on two countries figuring out a way to cooperate on habitat protection and restoration of migration corridors. Instead, in 2007, the United States started building a wall that separates the bighorn from the Tanaha Saltus water and the pronghorn from its extended family living south of the border. So I just want to show you now some photos that I have taken specifically of the wall and wildlife um, over the past five or six years. This is a desert cottontail. Um, that was right when the wall was being built in southern Arizona. Um, they still had the, the beams, the steel beams lying around. And this is a picture of um, javelina. And javelina are a, a peccary species, a really important species in the borderlands. Um, because they're a, um, a really important prey species, but they're also a seed distributor. So um, all of these plants that, that when the climates change that need to travel, plants do migrate, um, they migrate um, using their seed distributors, and javelina are one of those. And I watched these javelina as they traveled for about 100 yards um, along this wall. And every once in a while, they would go up to the wall and smell it and then they would keep traveling and go up and smell it. And finally, they just turned away, which is where I was taking this picture. And javelina are really familial animals. They, they live and uh, travel in really large packs, and they, they find each other through their sense of smell and their incredibly strong scent, um, which I think a human could probably smell from a mile away, and they can probably smell from about 10 miles away. I don't know, it's, it's very strong. But um, it was very clear to me watching them that they were, we, they were trying to find a way across and they probably smelled some of their family on the other side of the wall because um, this was shortly after that wall was built. And this is a, um, a video that was taken by a scientist. This is a Sonoran desert toad. And she watched these toads do this over and over again, different toads, until they died of dehydration or were taken by predators. Thousands of species are impacted um, through habitat loss and degradation, loss of migration pathways. And in an era of climate change, wildlife survival and adaptation will depend on their ability to move freely. It's also impacted people um, in many ways, from migrants to borderland residents who've had their land taken through eminent domain in order to, um, to build the wall. And many of our borderlands, national parks, wilderness, and other places of respite are now militarized zones. And unfortunately, the politics of immigration reform may soon make things much, much worse. Um, the Senate passed a measure in June um, that would link legal status for undocumented immigrants to a massive escalation of border enforcement measures, costing more than $40 billion. That would include the construction of 700 more miles of border wall, a doubling of the current Border Patrol, or Patrol force from 20,000 to 40,000 agents, and an expansion of the waiver of environmental law to allow military bases no longer needed in Afghanistan to be transferred to our national parks, wilderness, and wildlife refuges with no environmental review. If these provisions remain part of comprehensive immigration reform, we will lose more of this and this for this. All because some very powerful people are willing to sacrifice anything for this. So I've been working on this a while, and it can be a bit discouraging. Um, at this point, there's barrier built on about a third of the border. Um, about half of that third is a solid wall um, that's, that 
most terrestrial animals cannot get through. Um, and then about half of it is vehicle bearer, which is not quite as bad. Um, so you can see, though, that there is hope. Um, you know, wall has not been built along the entire border. Much of the border remains um, almost entirely wild. Uh, it hasn't really been touched by militarization. It, it doesn't have wall. Um, there is much there to protect. And as we all know, um, walls come down. It does happen um, frequently throughout history. So there's hope. And I believe all that separates us from a saner border policy is a change in perspective. On a journey to Big Bend National Park in 2011, I stood on the US bank of the Rio, looking inward on Santa Elena Canyon, a cathedral of towering stone walls carved by a once mighty river. Santa Elena's left canyon wall is Mexico. Her right wall, not 20 feet away, is the United States. From where I stood, the walls appeared to merge at the vanishing point within the canyon. At the top edge of this convergence, jagged topography creates what appears to be a crevice in a solid wall of rock, but is really just a bend in the top edge of the river corridor, a small wedge of space between the United States and Mexico. On this visit, I had risen several hours before dawn and perched myself at the opening of Santa Elena to wait for the moment when the full moon would set just before the first light appeared from the rising sun on the opposite horizon. That morning, all alone on the sandy edge of the Rio Grande, I watched moonlit ripples bob on the dark water, dancing their way toward the Gulf of Mexico. Then the great round orb of light began to slip into the hairline crack between two nations. And when it had descended between the rocky cliffs of the United States and Mexico, the moon's illumination burst into fractured light. Beams of pale moonlight streamed to the sky, to the river, to the canyon walls, indiscriminately illuminating earth, water, and sky on either side of this intellectual boundary. The seemingly choreographed departure, ordered to the most minute detail of time and space, ended as the moon disappeared behind the Sierra del Carmen and the last bits of light were withdrawn into the darkness of the canyon. As witness to this phenomenon, I can only describe it as perfect. A mile away, the moon would not appear to settle into this cleft, though it would still reflect on the surface of the Rio. A few thousand miles away in Washington, DC, the moon would be visible but not in the context of Santa Elena Canyon, or the Rio Grande, or the Borderlands, or Mexico. Context is everything. Down on the banks of the Rio, I begin to wonder where I am. Is this the United States, and is that Mexico, across a river I could almost jump? There isn't a sign of human development anywhere within visible reach of this almost inaudible river glittering with starlight. In this serene, starlit moment, I do not recognize the borderlands of television news and political tirades. Fear is infectious, a virus whose only cure may be perceiving reality with one's own eyes and ears. A coyote howls as the eastern horizon begins to glow. A small cat-like shadow approaches the river's edge upstream, pauses for a moment, and then swims across the placid water to Mexico. And as the first fiery arc of the sun breaks the horizon, a hatchling bird nestled in a tree on the north bank of the Rio cries for its breakfast. There is no sound as lonely as the disconsolate bleat of a hatchling bird in the wilderness. My heart counts the beats. One, two, three, as the helpless creature wails through the silence, begging for a response. It doesn't have to wait long. The reassuring answer is as swift as an echo off the canyon wall. From the south side of the river, the hatchling's foraging mom has alighted on a shrub in Mexico. I'm coming, she sings.